If there's one aspect of entertainment that has always captivated me, it was the length of which a show, movie, video game, or book would go and try and get me to believe in its world. Be it through wonderful characters, amazing sights, the latest graphics, or just an interesting story, the creativity found in fiction can inspire us, make us cry, and grow closer to us than many of our real-life friends. That's the beauty of fiction, its core strength, and it's always worth talking about. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I am your ever-friendly Pokeprof, and welcome to Fascinating Fiction. There are few franchises out there that have been around and have gone through as many different interpretations as the Transformers. Starting off as a toy line of different robots that can shift into a vehicle form, it has since become a multi-million dollar franchise with video games, TV shows, novels, an excellent if somewhat silly animated movie, and several live action films that should never be spoken about in polite company. Among all this, though, stands out not only a particular show that is considered by many to be above the rest, but a character within said show that, to this day, I feel has few equals in the story he tells. A warrior that few can match, let's talk about Dinobot. Named after the dinosaur-based Transformers from the G1 series, Dinobot actually starts off as one of the villains of Beast Wars, I'll bet an honorable one. Wishing for battle and glory, he finds that he can't stand having a coward for a leader, nor someone incapable of even landing them on the right planet, their original goal having been our Earth. While initially wishing to take control of the small faction of Predacons, he joins the Maximals instead, particularly after their leader goes and risks his life to save the Raptor. Though the initial relationship between Dinobot and his new allies is rocky, to say the very least, he quickly finds his place as the battle-scarred brawler of the group, balancing out Cheetor's enthusiasm, Rat Trap's cynicism, Rhinox's quiet intelligence, and Optimus Prime's leadership. He becomes their main strategist, offering his knowledge of how his former teammates and the Predacons as a whole worked to ensure their own victory. Though honorable and among the best fighters of the team, he wasn't without his flaws. As a Predacon, Dinobot would always try to seek the mantle of leadership, often trying to claim the role when Optimus was rendered unable to lead, be it from injury, incapacitation, or death. This would never last long, however, and there were even instances in which Dinobot shows off his respect for the Maximal Leader, on one occasion standing watch over him after he recovered from battle. I'd honestly say that's what really became a unique aspect of the show, and one that you don't see as much today even in the most serious of modern cartoons. It treated the events of the show, for the most part, like a war. While there were the occasional Looney Tune moments where characters were thrown about, squished, or spun like a top, death was always treated as a possibility. A prime example of this is when Dinobot thinks Rattrap, the character he fights with throughout the entire series, is dead. He said that he would not honor his ally with lies. He considered the demolitionist a foul-smelling pestilence, but admitted that he would miss him regardless. This is further compounded when he talks to a character introduced later in the series, Tigertron, about just what would happen if Megatron was able to get the energy of the planet as their own, and is able to use it to start the war back up on Cybertron. With the Petacons being obsessed with conquest, Dinobot details that how his former faction would never stop until they, and they alone, ruled over all. It was the reason they had to fight. To survive. After the craziness of a season finale that involves blowing up a moon, something that makes a great deal more sense with the context of the series, I assure you, we learn through the characters that they are indeed on Earth, just in prehistoric times. This leads Dinobot to have a crisis. One of the events that started the entire show was the Predacon stealing a golden disc that acted both as a record of history as well as a map detailing the location of Earth. That means now that the discs hold the details of the future. This is what led to the most interesting development of Dinobot as a character. He paraphrases Shakespeare, finding himself at a loss. 
Proud to a fault, he found that he could not live with himself if it was revealed that no one could change their future, that he was not the true master of his own fate. Nor, did he find, could he simply destroy the discs, as he saw it as a coward's answer. Unable to bear the weight of such a decision, he hides the discs away, intending on confronting what the answer could be at a later date. It's his own desire for victory, though, that leads Dinobot to leave his allies for a time. Thinking that Megatron is on the cusp of victory with his former leader, going through with his plans even without the discs to guide and aid him, Dinobot rejoins the Predacons and returns the golden disc that he stole. He finds shortly thereafter that he can't go against his maximal allies, forcing his blade against Megatron when tasked with killing Rat Trap. He admits then, to himself and to the rest of the Maximals, the insanity that the Predacon leader has fallen into in his attempts to change history, and how stupid he was to consider to be wanting to be part of that, forgoing his honor for a win. The shining moment, however, of Dinobot's character comes with the last episode he exists in. Named Code of Hero, the entire episode starts off with a failed attempt at suicide. Yeah, you heard that right. A kid's show, a CGI one at that, had a character so conflicted about his place in the universe and the control of his own destiny that he wished to kill himself. After all, what point is there in life if one's actions are finite? We see the truth of such matters when Dinobot tracks down Megatron. We see the Predacon leader destroy a mountain, and that same mountain on the disc itself changing, proving once and for all that the future was not set in stone. Anything that was done in the time they found themselves in could alter the very reality as the Predacon saw fit. That's when Megatron reveals the true extent of his plans, the extinction of the human race before it can truly evolve, targeting the valley which they originated from. With the Maximals too far away to make a difference in the fight, Dinobot laments the irony that, even though he now knows the future isn't set in stone, he finds that he has no choice at all. Blade in hand, he fights alone against all six of the enemy Predacons, working his best to defeat them as quickly as possible. Even then, the damage and the use of all of his strength takes its toll on him as he pushes his body to the limits. Dinobot's final moments come after he's taken down every foe barring Megatron, his former commander holding one of the proto-humans hostage. Even then, weaponless and with his entire body shotting down, Dinobot still fights. He takes a simple stick, fashioning it into a club by embedding a rock into the end of it, and is able to strike Megatron with enough force to free the golden disc, destroying it with the last bit of his energy. By the time his allies arrive, it's already too late. He knows that, in the end, he was able to save the lives of those in the valley, and all of the future generations that will come from that. He only has one request of the Maximals before he passes on. To tell his story, both the bad and the good, and let him be judged accordingly. The rest is silence. Despite being a kid's show that's meant to sell toys and having a name that one might struggle to take seriously, Dinobot is a character with rare qualities. He was a warrior of honor, willing to do what he thought was right, even when it went against the standards of his race. He craved power, true, but he would not just sit back and let wrong stand. Even to those allies that he had the most issue with, like Rat Trap, there was a respect that felt earned. It's not something you can say for just any character from any show or movie, and honestly, it's a story that I felt was worth sharing. With that, I hope you all enjoyed the premiere episode of Fascinating Fiction, and will hopefully look forward for more to come. Should you have any suggestions on something you'd like to see me cover, please leave a comment below, as well as liking the video and subscribing if you wish to see more content like this. It really does help us out. Be sure to also check out Getting With The Program, a more off-the-cuff show in which Kitty Cross, Ash, and Sky and I go through a series that one of us are not familiar with episode by episode and give our honest thoughts about them. I also have a Twitter and a Twitch if you wish to follow us there, where we usually will play games and just give my general thoughts about what's going on at the time. But until then, folks, stay frosty.